Costas joining us, I believe around 10 o'clock. He's on a different time as was Kira Dent and coordinating the different time zones sometimes gets goofy, but at some point he'll join us. I've given him permission to interrupt us at any time going forward now that the quiz is done. So whenever he shows up, we'll give him the floor and let him uh, do his speaking and his teaching and answer your questions that you may have and we'll go on from there. I wanted to give you an update about the simulation prizes that my wife and I securely packaged in DHL and sent to Jamaica. I don't know where they are. <laughs> so if they are still in processing, in clearance. I don't know what that means. Is that Does it mean they're in customs? I don't know. So I must have 30 or 40 emails, follow-up emails about those prizes. So I don't know, hopefully they're gonna show up. I don't want you to choose prizes and then have somebody have stolen them. So I just hope somebody has them so and that you can get them someday, but um, that will change our agenda for Friday if I don't have confirmation that they're there and have been verified that they're there, but hopefully they are there. Let's see. I sent you all an email yesterday. We don't need the full four hours on Wednesday or Friday. So class on tomorrow starts at nine. Class on Friday will start at nine. Class on Thursday starts at eight. The class is scheduled from eight to 12 on Thursday and from one to three on Thursday. That's to give you all the time you could possibly need to complete the simulation assessment and finalize the financial analysis for quarters 9, 10, and 11, 12. You may remember you need to complete that as part of the final simulation assessment. You may not need that much time. If everybody's done at 12, then we won't meet in the afternoon. If, you, if, your, if your group isn't done, then I'll just stay on Zoom for the afternoon. So we'll see how that goes. It's group work. You'll finish at different rates and that's okay. But I didn't want, that's basically a take home final exam for the simulation. Uh, and so I want, it's in class through Zoom, and I don't want anybody to be hurried. I want you to have plenty of time to get that done. So I've allocated lots and lots of time to get that done, probably more time than is needed. But I wanted to, again, give you more time than you need. All right. Let's see. Let's go ahead with, this is our last PowerPoint for the simulation. Talk about staff motivation. So I tweaked this even this morning before class, added a couple things to this, but um, let's just talk about staff motivation and what mo motivates you, what motivates staff in work generally and in a de dental office specifically. So the performance paradigm, or in other words, how does someone do in their job performance wise? Are they really excellent? Are they just okay? Are they way below average? Well, that depends on their ability and skill levels, how motivated they are, and the leadership that you create and the culture that you create in the practice. So all of those things combined to result in an individual and group's practice performance and performance in the job. That assumes that you've given them the proper equipment. I mean, if we couldn't all Zoom right now, we wouldn't be having a Zoom, right? Because there's no equipment to do it. Uh, that it assumes you've given them the proper support and encouragement and training that they need. This is particularly important, the support on the training side. I would, I have told a couple of the practices in our private consults that when the simulation charges you $8,000 to replace a staff member, it probably should be more like 16 to 24,000 because the actual amount is about 30 to 50 percent of what a staff member makes on an annual basis between the cost of hiring, interviewing, but more importantly, the support you have to provide in terms of onboarding that staff member and having them learn your philosophy, learning your core values and implementing your procedures and your systems. So this is where a lot of that cost comes from. Why do people work? Well, we wanna get paid and we wanna have benefits. We also work for psychological reasons, a sense of fulfillment of a job well done internally, you know, that makes us feel good about ourselves. So that's another reason people work. Another reason people work is social reasons. 
camaraderie, collegiality in a dental office, teamwork, being a part of a team. These are so much more social reasons. And I don't know about you, uh, but for me personally, I'm kind of a borderline introvert, extrovert, but I am starting to go crazy <laughs> from working at home. I don't have any contact with my colleagues. And you don't have contact that you used to have going to and from class, going in and out of clinic, how are things going? I mean, that whole support network, even from talking about the weather to, to anything, um, political events, I mean, we just don't have an opportunity to share like that. And so I think that kind of demonstrates if you're having any sense of that, and I certainly am by working from home, that kind of underscores that, I mean, there's more to work than just getting paid and psychological reasons. There's also the social dynamic and the relationships that we form with people and maintaining that and the communication that defines those relationships. So in the end, people work for their own reasons. Those reasons may not be your reasons. And that's important to keep in mind as a future practice owner who's supervising those staff. You may think they're motivated here, and maybe they are some here, but maybe they're also motivated here and here equally, and sometimes these can get out of proportion uh, if we're not careful to understand why people are working with it. It's for their own personal reasons, not what you think they're working for. Motivation has a lot to do with our work ethic. When Kira Dent had you identify your core values, all those core values that you identified were terminal values. A terminal value you, would be integrity, responsibility, behaving in an ethical manner, being accountable, being a part of a team. Those are all terminal values inherent to work. Instrumental values are values that you hold just to get something. I work to get a check. I work to get healthcare benefit. I work to get a day off. Those are much different you know, values going forward comparing those two, these core values versus this, I have a job just to get something out of it that's tangible. A worker's view of employment can vary differently from just being a job. And believe me, these days in the United States, there's nothing wrong with just having a job. That's better than not having a job at all, right? So, uh, so we're working on our unemployment and it's dropping after COVID-19, but it went, went high. Um, that's different though than a career path and a career track. So we talked a little bit about associateships yesterday. The more that you're moving toward an associateship as a dentist employee, the more that you move toward it as a career, the more detailed you really need to be about understanding what the practice numbers are and what the core values of the practice are and how much insurance is involved in that practice. If it's only a job for a year or two and you know you're going to leave, well, that's not as complicated a situation as if you plan to possibly be there for the rest of your life. Your source of motivation can be internal, something that's in driving you internal, or it can be external things around you. Uh, there's an actual instrument that measures something called locus of control or location of control. Are you motivated here or are you motivated here? And people can score on a scale. And I actually have a scale that measures this and that's part of our second year dental school curriculum. But those are obviously different sources of motivation. If I'm a self-starter, that's different than thinking I have to be motivated by somebody like a supervisor over here. <clears throat> There's an old theory of motivation. I think this was from somebody named McGregor. Uh, the old school idea of motivation is that we need to tr treat our workers as disliking work, assume that they're lazy, indolent, means they don't want to sweat. <laughs> lacking ambition, prefer external control, and then managers then want to be closely supervising, given directions, be authoritarian, boss-centered, and emphasize getting the job done or the task, as opposed to a theory Y orientation, which says that work is natural for adults. Kind of uh, the ideal job would maybe even be like play for an adult, because right? they enjoy it where people are self-directed, have self-responsibility and a sense of internal control. So you can see that internal, external manifested here, just in these two theories. And under this kind of approach to motivation, you provide general supervision, provide support, 
allow people to participate in decisions that affect them. This would be more employee-centered and more relationship-oriented. Some of the best theories and approaches of leadership say that different situations may, re may require you to go from this side to this side and back and forth. And there are times in life where you may need to be authoritarian and task oriented. So if you're in your practice right now in Kingston and there's an earthquake, you're not gonna call a meeting to ask people who's gonna leave the building first. You're just gonna say, get out of here, right? Or take shelter, whatever you're supposed to do. And so there are situations where you may have to do that. Generally speaking, staff are probably gonna be more responsive to this kind of approach. You have the whole online course on this Maslow's Levels of Need. So a bit of background on, on that course at dentalcare.com. I had written a course for them, a couple of them, and they contacted me if, if I would review the course because the person who wrote the course, Dr. Schwartz, passed away. And it's been a popular course and they didn't want to get rid of it. And so they asked me if I would just review it and tweak it and update it a little bit. So I did that. So we're not going to go through these because the entire course is built around these and how to motivate staff here, how to motivate staff here and here and here and here. So you'll have a separate test on that. And again, so there's not a lot of point in going through that into this in much detail at this point. Aldefer is mentioned in that online course. He kind of took Maslow's needs of safety and, and uh, physical needs and said those really are all about existence and having physical safety. And he took these needs of belonging, social needs and relationship needs and called those relatedness. So social and interpersonal relationships this receiving esteem and recognition from others. And he took these last higher, what he calls higher order needs or deeper needs that we may have and called those personal growth needs. These, relieves, these refer to self-esteem and self-actualization and achievement and feeling good about ourselves when we do those things. So all the first levels then, as Willis simplifies them, he thinks of existence needs or safety needs and physical needs from Maslow as what you're paying people and the benefits that you're providing. Relatedness needs are really social and growth needs are more psychological in nature. So these, do, these needs do motivate us. Um, we have a relative who lives in a city in the United States where the peaceful protests were hijacked by criminals and then they burned houses down and burned businesses down and our relative lives right there where that's happening and she wants to feel safe and so she has put her house on the market and they're buying another house in another location in another state because we got to feel safe. And if we don't feel safe, that motivates us to take action. This theory, I think, has a lot to do with whether staff leave in the simulated world, even though it's hypothetical. And it has a lot to do with how people are motivated. And this, uh, this particular motivation theory is summarized in the updated team motivation course on dentalcare.com as well, but I want to spend just a little bit of time fleshing this out. So what happens in this kind of an approach to understanding motivation is that each of us individually asks ourselves how much input we are giving to our jobs, how much effort, how much time we're putting in, how hard are we working, really, that's input here, individual input, that each person is putting into the job. And then we look at what our outcomes are, individual outcomes. What are the results of me putting in that effort and time to get things done? What goals am I achieving? How am I materially contributing to the dental practice? If I'm a hygienist, what's my recall rate? How can I get that higher? If I'm a front desk receptionist person, is it possible for me to have a list of people I can call if we have a short notice cancellation and get them in the chair and increase our capacity? So we look at how much effort we're putting in 
and what the results are of everything that we put in. And then we compare ourselves to others around us in the practice. How much effort and time are others putting in? And what kind of outcomes are others contributing to the practice? What goals are they contributing to the practice? And if my perception is that I'm doing more than others, my motivation does this, right? And I think that's true of all of us. Gosh, I'm putting in all this effort and I'm getting all these results and gosh, there's the people next to me aren't doing that. Man, that's not right. That's not fair. That's not equitable. And then I think, well, maybe I'm not going to work as hard as I should. Now, this also happens in a situation in the wider market marketplace so that an individual will say, okay, how hard is this person working in this practice? How much are they contributing to the goals of the practice? And then they may compare, not just within the practice to other staff, but they'll compare to the wider marketplace, right? How much are we getting compensated versus what is our effort compared to others? And so this is an ongoing issue where I work because our policy as a university says that our salary should be right in the middle compared to everybody else, not at the highest level, not at the lowest level, but we've been at the almost the lowest level for over 20 years. And so our faculty look at that and think, well, gosh, maybe I should work somewhere else, you know? And I think staff do the same thing, yeah? Hygienist says, gosh, I'm making $28 an hour and Bogdan's offering 38. I'm going to go work with Bogdan, or, you know, or whatever. So sometimes you will lose staff based on that. Operant or reward theory, behavior depends on its consequences. And as the supervisor of the dental practice, you're in control of those consequences, good or bad. The consequence could be a raise, a bonus an extra benefit. The consequence could be a warning that if they don't improve their performance, they may not be able to keep their job. Consequence could just be saying, Leah, really good job on handling that emergency today. I mean, it could be lots of different things, right? So, but you as the supervisor control the consequences. And it depends on what's going on in the environment. What are, what are considered, what are called antecedents or cues to the behavior? In other words, are you setting clear expectations for that staff member? Yesterday, I showed you on RVLE a whole set of job descriptions you can use to set expectations for staff. The textbook chapter on staffing has a whole series of job descriptions. The purpose of those job descriptions is, say, is to say, here is what you are expected to do in your job. It is a cue to behavior or what's called an antecedent in this theory of how we behave. But you can just think about it in terms of expectations. When Kira Dent says, we're gonna have a 30 day list for you when you come on board, this is what you should do, a 60 day list and then a 90 day list. She's got all these lists. All those are saying, here's your expectations. This is what we want you to perform. And when she says you should have a monthly review or maybe you're gonna have a quarterly or a six month review, whatever that is, you are setting the expectation of what you want from the staff member. Then they behave in a certain way and they meet those expectations or they don't. And then there should be outcomes or consequences for doing that. Positive, potentially negative as well. So positive reinforcement. So you know what this phrase means, kick in the <laughs> kick in the behind. So positive reinforcement rewards good behavior. Somebody does something, you notice it, say, way to go. Negative reinforcement takes away a negative outcome to encourage behavior, such as you are going to per perhaps discipline somebody or dismiss them, they behave in the way you expect, and then you take away that threat of dismissal. Well, that's negative, considered negative reinforcement. Punishment, negative consequence for poor performance. Extinction occurs when there's really no consequence for behavior of whatever kind. And so this is something organizations are gonna struggle with, the university's struggling with right now, because right now there's no, there's no salary money, no benefit money to reward anybody where I work because of COVID-19 and lost revenue. 
So over time, if that continues, the people who work really, really hard are going to say, gosh, you know, I am internally motivated, but I also have to have something tangible for this extra work that I'm doing. And so that can become a real challenge over time. Workplace rewards can also be extrinsic, positive, you know, actual tangible things that you're going to encourage people with including bonus programs, surprise bonuses. Maybe it's not even announced. You could just say, hey, we did really good last, last quarter and here's an extra $50 or something like that. You could do that. You might even do get individual gifts to your staff or group gifts like at Christmas. I know, I know a, a friend of mine who practiced in Denver, Colorado for many, many years would take his staff to the mall. So maybe you'd take your staff to the Sovereign Mall there in Kingston. Uh, he would have lunch with them, and then he would surprise them by giving them each $200 in cash. And he would say, I want you to go in the mall, and I want you to spend this money. And the only rule is you got to spend it on yourself. And then we're going to meet afterwards for Blue Mountain Coffee, and you're going to tell us what you bought for yourself. And then they'd give him a couple hours to go shopping. Then they'd come back, and then they'd show each other what they bought for themselves. So you can do those kinds of gifts to encourage people as well. Intrinsic rewards include positive psychological kicks or encouragements in the behind. This can be recognitions in terms of employee of the month awards, uh, attaboy documents, the online motivation course had an idea of giving staff members a written recognition card that's this. And showing honest appreciation to your staff is part of this as well. I will tell you that um, I've been measuring the personalities of dentists here for, for many, many years. And every single year, when you measure personality using one of the personality assessments, you can identify the temperament of dentists. And about 75 to 80% of dentists have a temperament that does not recognize routine acceptable work. In other words, the expectation of most dentists, and I can say this with pretty good authority because I have a sample of 15 years in a row of doing this with the same result. The expectation of most dentists is, well, I told you what to do and you did it, so, so why should I say anything? Well, if staff, want to be recognized and you don't recognize them, then that's a missed opportunity to reinforce them and to motivate them. And so this is something that some of you may have to do on a conscious basis, catch people doing things that are well. And so Carol Ann may see somebody really doing a really excellent job in sterilizing the instruments and just say, you know, you do this every day, you just do a super job and we really appreciate that. That goes a long way with staff really encourages them. Some guidelines for incentive systems. Link incentive to employee desires, how whatever motivates them. This could be based on individual and group performance. Link the incentive to desired goals that you have in your practice. You wanna keep incentives from becoming entitlements. In other words, I should get it no matter what. And make plans easy to administer and understand if you're going to use incentive systems. You don't want them so complicated people can't understand what the rules are. Some potential issues with incentive systems. The focus can become the reward, not the work itself. Employees could feel manipulated. And increasing goals could lead to frustration. In other words, if you have a bonus system or an incentive system, and it just gets, gets getting harder and harder and harder to achieve month after month after month, quarter after quarter, year after year, people may just say, throw up their hands and say, you know, this is just, it's not achievable. We can't, can't get there. Examples of bonus systems. There's an example that's discussed, discussed in detail on the dentalcare.com course on team motivation. It gives you examples with dollar amounts and numbers of how you could use a bonus system. And just this morning, I grabbed from our course postings from our practice management course, a simple one page collection based bonus system, courtesy of Ms. Amy Kirsch. We went over her group hiring a couple of days ago. So I posted that on RVLE. It's the last document under the staffing topic. 
So these are, this is just a, an additional reference for you to grab and use and see if you want to. Yesterday we mentioned the bonus system Dr. Costas has implemented, which is more sophisticated than this. So, and that's also mentioned in the RV on the dentalcare.com course, but in Dr. Costas's bonus system, the team has to meet net production goals, net uh, then collection goals, as well as overhead percentage goals. And only if all three of those numbers are met does any bonus get awarded. So you could look at those and make decisions about whether they want to implement those or not. So kind of an overview on staff motivation. Questions about any of that? From anybody? No questions. Okay. Well, we're headed toward the finish in the simulation. So some of your profits have begun to maybe top out or bottom out. So you may wanna look at what strategies could you use to lower your costs or increase your revenue going forward. Having said that, you're all still making huge amounts of profits. I mean, really, I mean, so you're all doing really well. So you can try to finish as strong as you possibly can. I will warn you that your incident for quarter 11 is pretty dicey, pretty thorny. You may get stung uh, no matter what you do here, but the, the case study is related to staff motivation. So those aligned today, you have a dental assistant named Laverne and Laverne isn't performing up to your standards and you have to decide what you're going to do. Remember, you know, basically Armageddon happens after quarter 12, <laughs> the simulation ends, right? It doesn't go on. So, you know, this isn't a long-term decision in terms of the simulation. So take a look at that incident. Incident 11, employee performance problem with Laverne. And again, that's always in the manual in chapter seven, simulation manual, and it's also posted online on the website. So we should have plenty of time here to do your short consultations before Dr. Costas joins us. I'll stay on Zoom here in case he would, would wanna uh, go ahead and start early. Otherwise, I'm gonna give you till like um, quarter after nine to begin to review your quarter 10 results. And remember my coaching is doing this. We're getting less and less and less coaching. So today you get to ask one question. It could be a really complicated question. Like, do I change my hours or do I increase staff and ops? I mean, that's a really complicated question that involves several variables. But you can ask that kind of a question, but you're still just limited to the one question for this quarter. And tomorrow you're on your own. So I'm pushing you out of the nest to fly for quarter 12 on your own. So one question today, I will we'll just do practice consults today for the one question in order, beginning with practice one and then end with practice five. And I'll start those groups uh, about 15 after nine so that you have plenty of time to look at your quarter 10 results before we meet. All right. And I did, by the way, do the taxes and that all worked the way it was supposed to. Sometimes there's a glitch in the simulation it doesn't work. So I was thankful that didn't happen. So I'll see you around 9.15 for our consults.
Um, Professor Dunning, we don't see our quarter 10 results. Uh-oh, is that anybody else not seeing them? Oh, I know what happened. They are listed in binary form. Binary form. In other words, it doesn't go it doesn't go oh. one. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is there. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to say that that happens every year. So you're not the that every that happens to everybody every year to somebody, Lisa. So you're not the only one. All right. <laughs> Thank now, you. For some reason, you know, it goes one and then ten and then two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There. Cool.